I started with the trad climbing on Canadian Rockies limestone, which basically means you don't fall. And then eventually ice climbing and easy alpine climbing, and then eventually sport climbing and that sort of thing. So that's how it all started, just seeing the mountains and going, how do I get to the top? And then realizing that I have to get all these skills in order to do it. And I'm, I'm a hack, you know, like I'm not any athlete at any level, <laughs> but I just love climbing. What's going on, everyone? I'm Nils Midnick, and this is the Backcountry Podcast, a show aimed at providing insight into the outdoor industry by interviewing people who operate within it. Today, I'm going to be chatting with Colin Powick, a mechanical engineer by training, product developer by nature, and climber at heart. With over 30 years of climbing experience and 20 years at Black Diamond, Colin has a vast wealth of knowledge when it comes to all things climbing, and I'm really stoked to dive into today's episode. Colin, what up? All right. Hey, thanks for having me. Psyched yeah. to be here. Yeah. How you doing? How's your summer been? Doing great. Summer's been awesome. Climbing around. A little change of scene for me recently, so uh, pretty much just climbing full time now, so it's been awesome. Yeah, that's really yep. cool to hear. And we'll kind of we're gonna bounce back and forth a yep. little bit here, but I think it's maybe some relevant context to talk about your current role at Black Diamond or with Black Diamond. Yep. Sounds pretty uh, pretty cush. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a little <laughs> different. So after 20 years of being an office guy, I uh, retired in April, uh, but I'm still on in an advisory sort of ambassador kind of role, and the title that I kind of dubbed myself was the chief field liaison officer. So I'm out in the field and uh, just out there, you know, climbing with people. And uh, I check back in with the office. I'm actually here in Salt Lake to visit in with the office and with the president and the development guys and doing product testing and hanging out with the athletes. And so I'm still involved, but uh, the office days are over and uh, just mainly climbing. Yeah, so it's been great. Congratulations. Yeah, that thanks. sounds nice. Long, long run. Yeah. Long time coming. Yeah, yeah totally. And you know, to back things up, you said 20 years of Black Diamond, mm -hmm. 30 years climbing. Where did you start climbing? So that's a great question. So I'm a, my wife and I are both engineers from Canada. Mm -hmm. And uh, one year after graduating, I ended up working on a river, kayaking and raft guiding and that sort of thing. And the sort of the standard deal is in the winter, everyone moves out west and works at ski hills. So I'm an engineer, just got my degree, but I was not really using it. You know, I was doing this thing, went out West to Fernie, British Columbia, just fell in love with the mountains. And I was like, okay, this is, this is what I want to do. And then just kind of started climbing from there and eventually moved to Calgary and Canmore, Alberta area. And back then, you know, there wasn't really gyms. Gyms were just starting to happen. And I just started, you know, scrambling peaks. And then you quickly sort of realize there's a bunch of tools in the toolbox that you need in order to get up these things. So back then started trad climbing, sport climbing was happening. Like this is in the early nineties. Okay. You know, sport yeah, climbing was, was kind of happening, but not, uh, not as big of course as it is today. And gyms were super small scale. So started trad climbing in Canadian Rockies limestone, which is scary, you know, cause it's, it's choss. Yeah. Wasn't and, it from what it looks like in Canmore, is it kind of similar? It almost seems like it was maybe like a similar, um, growth growth time is like American Fork, like stuff I've seen from Canmore. Yeah, I would say that I, it, it feels about right. I mean, I'm not super, super buffed out on the history, but it feels about right. But I started with the trad climbing on Canadian Rockies limestone, which basically means you don't fall because the rock isn't good and you know, you're just starting out and that kind of thing. And then eventually ice climbing and easy alpine climbing and then eventually sport climbing and that sort of thing. So that's how it all started, just seeing the mountains and going, how do I get to the top? And then realizing that I have to get all these skills in order to do it. And I'm, I'm a hack, you know, like I'm not any athlete at any level, <laughs> but I just love climbing. Did you grow up on the eastern side of Canada? Yeah, near Toronto. I actually grew up a water guy. Like I was a water skier, windsurfer, eventually a whitewater kayaker. You know, there's no mountains out there and climbing wasn't really a thing back in the 80s when you were a kid in high school or whatever. So, yeah, I don't know, just kind of came out of the blue. I've always been an outdoor guy. But then when I headed out west, like I said, and saw the mountains, it was like, okay, this is what I'm talking about. Yeah. yeah. And was it was it that time moving out west that um, did you want to ever like fully step away from mechanical engineering degree wise? Or was no. it always kind of like enticing to be like, oh, my God, look at all well, this gear. How do I like connect the dots? So yes and no. So this, this is a great question. So. I wasn't really using my degree. This is just one year out of school. So I was just kind of just chilling out and doing stuff. Went out there, 
knew that I wanted to be in the mountains and then instantly knew that most small mountain towns, which I was drawn to, probably don't have mechanical engineering jobs. So then I went back to school and did my teaching degree to become a teacher to teach kindergarten to grade six because every mountain town has a school, right? So I was like, I am a genius, I'm gonna do this. So then I, I did that, then I moved back out west and I started teaching and then I quickly realized I should probably use my engineering degree that I put so much work into. So I moved to Calgary, got an engineering job. So I was actually using my engineering degree. I was in the oil field and gas sort of business out there, which isn't really a passion of mine. You, you don't know? say. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I used that for a couple of years, was driving from Calgary into the mountains every single weekend. And then one thing led to another and then landed here. I can go into that if you like. Yeah, totally. That kind of, I mean, it segues, you know, I want to, yeah, sort of understand how you ended up in Salt Lake and at Black Diamond. Yeah. Because well, that's like at the time, like yeah. you and your your wife, Ellen, Ellen, yeah. um, were pretty like devout gung-ho climbers. Exactly. So the story, this is, uh, I'm not sure if anyone's that interested in this, but I think it's fun. So yeah, I started climbing, unbeknownst to me. My future wife, Ellen, started climbing. She started climbing in the gym, and I was climbing outside. And I bumped into her at the gym, actually. And I recognized her from the university we went to, because we went to the same university, but didn't really know it. You know, and I recognized her. And I'm like, oh, hey, you're Ellen. And she goes, you're Colin, and we should go climbing. So we started climbing together. And I had never taken a fall. Like, I'd never sport climbed, and she was getting into that. And she had never track climbed or ice climbed or anything like that. So I was getting her into that. And then we climbed Denali together in 98. She'd never even winter camped before that, you know. And then we decided to get married and go on a one-year honeymoon climbing trip. So we quit our jobs and sold everything we owned. I was 30 at the time. She was 28 or Genius. something. Smart idea. So we quit our jobs, sold everything we owned, bought an RV, got married on a Saturday, and on Sunday hit the road. And a year later... We landed in Salt Lake. Like we heard about Salt Lake and we drove through and we climbed and we were on the road literally for a year. And at like month 11.5, we decided let's come to Salt Lake. Boom, look for engineering jobs. You know, Salt Lake's great with the proximity to the climbing and a big enough city to have engineering jobs. Look for engineering jobs, bought a house and we're gonna stay one to three years, you know, and that was 25 years ago. There you go. <laughs> yeah. That's a long three years. Yeah, it's a long three <laughs> years, but we love it. Yeah, it's great here. Oh, uh, that's cool. I mean, I kind of, Similar to that, I um I grew up in Vermont. Yeah. And started snowboarding at a super early age. And a lot of people on the East Coast, same deal. Made yeah. that like Western migration. Right. And at first I always I kinda always knew I was gonna stay out here, but I didn't think I was gonna stay in Utah. Right. As long as I have. I went out to um Park City is where I landed to go to a, a school that kind of accommodated my snowboarding schedule yeah. at the time. Yeah. And same deal. I thought that I would move to Colorado or move to California or something right. as soon as I was done with high school. And that was yeah. a little over 10 years ago now. Yeah, that's yeah. what happens. <laughs> like, we had no intention of staying here that long. And when we came to Salt Lake, the proximity to the climbing, like before and after work, and then the weekend climbing, and then the radius, you know, the two hour radius, the City of Rocks, and then you go to the Moab and the Creek and the St. George and the VRG and the Rifle and then the Valley. Like, it's incredible. So for us, that our whole thing really is climbing and working. That's kind of all we do is work and climb. And we loved it. And we weren't planning on staying here 25 years. And and we did. And 25 years later, and then we recently just moved, you know, literally three month, two months ago back <laughs> home. But uh, it wasn't the plan. It, you know, it just kind of kind of happened. So it goes. So yeah, it goes. Yeah. And then, you know, you, you land in Salt Lake. And is that, did you start at Black Diamond right away then? So no, what did, I, no. How did you end up at Black Diamond? I had a couple. I had two different engineering jobs while I was here. And, you know, the climbing community in Salt Lake, especially back then, was pretty small. And my wife's really good, and I'm a pretty good belayer. So people <laughs> see me belaying, you know, the strong girl. And so you just end up meeting people, you know, as you do at the cliff. And then uh, I was working in this small manufacturing company. And then kind of out of the blue, the BD guys came over one day and said, hey, you know, want to talk to you, you're interested in a job at BD? Because I wasn't really looking at the time. And I was like, sure, let's talk. And, uh, and then ended up, they needed someone to run their quality department. And that's where I started. But interestingly enough, when we moved here in 99, right after a one year trip, the first phone call I made was to Black Diamond. Hmm. And uh, cause I had the catalog, I phoned the number on the back and I said, can I talk to an engineering manager? I just told this story recently at my retirement party. And uh, they put me through to the engineering manager. I said, hey, I'm a 
young engineer, five years experience from Canada. I'm a climber. You looking for anybody? And at that time they said, he said something like, we're not growing. We're not looking for anybody and nobody ever leaves good luck and, and, and hung up the phone and I'm like, okay, so no job at BD for me. And then, uh, it was, uh, I guess three years later that I started there. Yeah. 2002. Wow. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Got to wonder who left. Yeah. Something, ha something happened. We, and we are growing and, and sometimes people do leave, but, uh, it was pretty classic. What was it and, like? I, so I've had, and I've gotten to know a handful of people that have worked at BD probably over the last 10 years almost. Yeah. What was it like when you started working at Black Diamond? Like, what was the work culture like? I'm yeah. sure it must have been pretty different. I can tell you, I can tell you exactly what it was like. I was amazed. I was amazed at how young everybody was that was running that place, like from the senior guys down to the young guys, how like motivated and stoked these guys were, and girls, of course, um, and how smart people are really smart. And I'm like, oh man, you know, these guys are smart guys and girls, you know? Uh, and it was, and it still is, you know, it's climbers and skiers working on stuff that they love. And it's, you know, people think, oh, it's all cool. And all you do is talk about climbing and go climbing all the time. Like it's a real job, you know, it's a real job. It's a real business. We need to be profitable. There's a lot of things to think about, but we just happen to be working on really cool stuff that we all really love. And I've been there 21 years. I was in the office right before I came here and you know, is it different? Sure, it's different, but it's the same too. You know, you get young people, now older people too, you know, <laughs> I'm now an old guy, um, but people that are just psyched on the company, the climbing, like not everyone there is a climber or a skier, right? But even the people, the the woman that works in HR or the guy that works in, in accounts receivable, they just love like the vibe, you know, the the culture of climbing is pretty unique, I think. Um, I think a lot of people compare it to the surfing culture where, you know, live to surf, surf to live, you know, that kind of thing. There's a lot of that going on really open and, and welcoming to new people. You know, there's no, people think that there's a lot of ego and like, oh, if you're not a 514 climber, don't even bother showing up. And that's not true. I mean, just this morning I took our VP of HR first time ever up Stewart's Ridge, the classic five, seven in big cottonwood. She'd never climbed before. And her, she was, I should show you the photo. She's beaming, like just psyched, you know? And, uh, so it's just like that kind of thing. It's a really fun, fun vibe. Yeah. That's yeah. kind of what I've picked up on over the, over the years. I mean, I think there's something really valuable, especially as an outsider, seeing a, a brand like that. And backcountry has this parallel as well, right? That like most, pretty much everyone that works at the company gets it. Right. What, whatever it is that your like lifestyle is exactly. most, most likely is a complete overlap with what you're doing for work. So, right. You almost have this, yeah, more like curated personalities or just, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, a lot, there's a like lot fun. of passion, I would say. It's, it's maybe an overused word, but I was mm. just talking to another guy this morning. He's not really a climber or a skier, but he's into fishing, you know, like he really loves going fishing. And fishing guys are passionate about fishing. And he happens to work at BD where, frankly, a lot of people are hunter guys and fisher guys and girls and and uh, and climbers and skiers and the whole deal. So it's just kind of that that sort of mutual passion over being outdoorsy stuff, you know, that really brings the the group together. Like, it's pretty awesome. Like, all those guys are my friends, you know, like, and not to, not to discount where my wife works, but she's an engineer working in tech security and, you know, internet stuff and all like this sort of things. And she doesn't hang out with those guys, you know, because she's a climber and has a passion. So I've felt very fortunate in my whole career to be hanging out with all these guys and girls that you can just spend the weekends with and go climbing, you know, it's yeah. cool. Yeah, uh, that's so cool. And now I want I want to dive into specifically your role at yeah. Black Diamond and like what that's kind of looked like because I mean a twenty year arc in relatively or maybe it's exactly the same space product development is that correct? Yeah, yeah, at some level like different different nuances for sure. Totally, but in in that side for sure. And um, what were some of like the earlier projects you were working on? You know, and yep. So I started in two thousand two and I was the I worked in the quality department and we were quite, we were a lot smaller back then. And one of the first projects we did was updating the Camelots, which had been done. I'm not sure when before in the, in the mid nineties and went from oh, a wow. single stem with the thumb, the hard thumb thing yeah. to the loop. And, uh, you know, the thumb loop oh, that's wow. on them now. Yeah, so that's yeah, what yeah. we did in 2002. I think they came out in 2004 and that was one of the first big projects. And that is such a big jump. Yeah. 
Yeah. And the weight and, and the yeah. size ranges. And we got rid of the three and a half, you know, there's lots of stuff like that. And Johnny Woodward, who's legendary, he worked there at the time, Andrew McLean, like all these guys. Yeah. And I was the quality guy and, and sort of the brief was like, don't screw it up. You know, like, <laughs> be like Camelots are the thing, right? Don't screw it up. So that was really exciting to be working on, you know, in my mind, when somebody says, well, what do you think of BD? What product do you think of? You think of the Camelot. You know, that's what a lot of people think of. I was going to kind of touch on that. I yeah. feel like there's a really big brand, brand image association. Yeah. Right. And then that's also, um, you know, it's like a, a product that uh, inherently carries a lot of liability. For sure. <laughs> and, that, and that was my whole life. So as the, as the quality guy, and then eventually I had a bigger team around me, of course, I would tell my parents, you know, they were like, you know, so what do you do? You know, like what? And uh, I'm like, you know, I'm kind of like a doctor, you know, just saving people's lives every day. <laughs> and uh, they're like, yeah, I don't think so. But um, that's what we had to do. You know, that's the history of Black Diamond. Why Black Diamond exists. I don't know if you know the story from Chenard Equipment and a liability lawsuit where Yvonne Shen Chenard folded Black Diamond because the climber was killed. And uh, back I didn't in, know that yeah, back transition. In, yeah, so back in 87, and I might get the years a little wrong so people listening can, can call me out for sure, but Chenard Equipment was a small company. Peter Metcalf was running it, and then Yvonne had broken off earlier before. He still owned it and, and created the small little brand you may have heard of called Patagonia, right? Mm, so yes. Yeah, okay, so you're with me. So Patagonia and Chenard Equipment. And then there was an accident, and uh, there was a lawsuit, and Yvonne decided to fold Chenard Equipment, and he, he folded it, chapter, I guess, chapter 11 bankruptcy. Mm. And then Peter Metcalf and a handful of the employees decided to buy all the assets out of bankruptcy and create this new company called Black Diamond and moved it from Ventura, California to Salt Lake City for the proximity to the mountains, international airport, workforce, like all this, all this stuff, climbing, backcountry skiing, that kind of thing. So that's where, that's where Black Diamond was formed, was basically because of a liability situation. So my job when I came in 2002, I mean, there was a, there was a gap between when it, when it formed in 91. I think Black Diamond officially moved to Salt Lake in 91. So there was, other, there was other people working there doing the quality kind of thing. And then my job was really, back to the liability question, was we have to make sure that our product is safe, that we warn people uh, about the risks of climbing and the risks of using this gear. And so that was a big part of it is all the testing. So we had a, the guys and the girls in the QA lab doing all the testing in order to get the products certified so that we could, so that we could sell them. Yeah, totally. So it, that was a big part of it. Yeah. And like, how was it? I mean, cause you probably just did a lot of like even developing what the architecture of the QA lab looked like, yeah. right? Cause you guys are bringing, you know, bringing to market products that yeah. hadn't been, you haven't had to test something like that right. before. You yeah. know what I mean? And yeah. like, how was this is, I don't know, maybe more esoteric, but in snowboarding, the, the, the line between product development and athlete is almost blurred yeah. at a certain point. Yeah. And there's a lot of like back and forth and feedback and yeah. there's lab time and then there's field testing. Right. And like, it's sort of more curated and buffed out now because of yeah. sports aged and matured. Yeah. Um, has climbing, have you kind of seen the same arc within climbing as well? Or was it all dialed when you got there? No, 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 no. <laughs> it, it, it wasn't dialed. Let me, I'll just babble for a second and I might yeah, answer your question totally. in there. So in order to sell products into Europe, they have to be what's called CE, CE. certified. Yeah. yeah. And there's a certain very discreet list of things that the product needs to meet. Now, the reality is you can make a product, let's just take a carabiner or a cam, for example, and it can meet that, but it can basically be not a not great product, right? So the basic testing is something that you have to do, but it's kind of the, we just call it the above and beyond testing. And that's what really, I think, separates us from a lot of others because we are all users of this stuff and we have everybody's best interest in mind. Like, I mean, my wife's using the gear, my friends are using, you know, we're all using the gear. So it's not only how you use the product, but it's how you know it's going to get misused and abused because let's face it, we're all a bunch of clowns and we're out there doing stuff that's maybe a little sketchy. And we know how people are gonna use and misuse and abuse this stuff. Yeah, so we create, all, yeah. exactly, we create all these tests that we don't need to create. You know, we don't need to pass these tests, but we know where Black Diamond came from, the Chenard example, right? We wanna make damn sure that when something leaves this building that we 
know how it's going to be used, misused, and abused, and warn against stuff that you can't maybe design around. And that was really the job, and still is the job to this day, of the QA guys and girls, the team there now, which is a lot bigger than when I started. And I would say that we, you know, the number one priority, I always say, is make sure we don't kill anybody, right? Good goal. So that's the number one. But then it's also a business, and there's financial implications, right? So for sure, climbing gear is our number one priority. Make sure that it meets the test and all that kind of stuff. But then you look at something that's not uh, a piece of PPE, personal protective equipment. Take a headlamp, for example, or a trekking pole. Those need to be good too. Now, if one of those breaks, maybe someone's not going to get hurt. Maybe they are. But you can't have a huge a huge run of poles go out and then something happens then you have a recall and financially it's a it's a yeah, thing totally, too yeah, right if you're, so, yeah, if you're like quality control slips it, exactly that financially on trekking poles it, right that it, completely comes back to bite you in a maybe it's a financially significant right way. and then you get bad press or bad pr and then it's like oh if you can't make a trekking pole i don't want your carabiner or whatever so i mean the qa guys and girls the number one focus is climbing gear but we focus on everything from apparel to footwear the skis like they all go through the rigmarole, like we have a team of guys and they're just testing worst case, what's going to happen if, what happens when, you know, that's, that's what they do. I mean, that's like, you can see it too. It's a, it's a testament to, again, all the, all the products, right. From, from headlamps to obviously the cams, but yeah. also just a like daily driver flannel or fleece or something. Sure. It's almost like that, um, company like brand mindset. Exactly. It's like, our stuff is dialed. Exactly. Doesn't matter what it is, but if it has our branding on it, people know it's it, you exactly. can trust it. Because we're using it all the time. Like you know, when you get some sample and of a flannel, and then you you pop it, and the button pops off. Like that's not cool. No. You know, so we <laughs> so we we have like tests for all that kind of stuff, and we do have a a pretty rigorous field test program. So there's there's a bunch of different aspects to quality. There's the upfront lab testing there during the development of a product to make sure that when you make it, it's going to meet everything you want it to make. And then there's the field testing, which is, is, sound, is exactly that. You know, it's out using it in the field, climbing or backcountry skiing or hiking or trail running or whatever it may be. And that's with, we have a great field testing squad because a lot of, so many users in the building, right? So you can yeah. literally hand something out. Hey, you're going down to the creek, take this. Mm -hmm. Let me know when you get back. And then of course our athletes too. We use the athletes a lot. And then there's the, there's the, the testing part of when something's in production, we do a bunch of testing to make sure that it's continually meeting all the requirements that we set up at the beginning of the process, right? So there's a lot involved. Before you see that shiny little carabiner on the wall, like there's a lot that went behind that. Yeah, you know, so yeah. much, the whole life cycle that goes into that yeah. thing. Yeah. You know, you'd be a good person to talk to about this too because I'm curious if you had to deal with this aspect um, of product development, but... I'm sure, you know, in snowboarding, there's some very specific things as, as a rider. That's, yeah. that's my like traditional background and kind of current background. Yeah. I'm a snowboarder yeah. and I'll work with, you know, some of my sponsors and every time it's, it's some of the same things where I'm like, can the board be stiffer, more right. aggressive, yeah, like yeah. for, oh, yeah. for me, Oh yeah. you know, oh, like, yeah. Oh, yeah. you know where I'm going with this, <laughs> I where, like, exactly with, where I think with climbing and especially the personalities you have <laughs> with sure. climbing, like. I've come to learn of like what I can and can't ask for. And sometimes I yeah. just need to like ask for something custom made Yeah, because I know that like, like it's not a viable, profitable product. It's got to be, you commercial, can like, it's gotta be commercially viable. Yeah, right? commercially we get viable, that. Totally. We get that all the time for yeah. sure. And I get it, you know, cause I'm like that too. There's certain stuff that I want for me because I do stuff a certain way. And part of the job. So that, that was, you know, a pretty good summary. We're kind of segueing in it to my second job, if that's okay. Yeah, so that was it. So that was the quality part of the job. And I could go on forever about that. And then the next part of the job, I was the climbing category director, it was called. And there's, there, there's different business units within Black Diamond. There's climbing, backcountry skiing, mountain, which covers trekking poles, headlamps, packs. There's um, footwear and apparel. So there's all these discrete sort of business units. And... Part of the job of the category director is to take all these inputs, like you're talking about, from athletes, from your friends, from yourself, from the retailers, and try to decide what should our product line look like. You know, I always say that the category director is a human funnel. All these inputs come in, they blend it, and you have to decide what are we going to do. And to your point, the athletes are great because 
you know, they are considering themselves like, hey, for me to do what I need to do, this is what I'm looking for. And your job is to go, is this applicable from a commercial perspective? Do other people want this? Or are you crazy man or woman, <laughs> right? And so sometimes we'll make stuff, literally one-offs for these athletes to do some stuff. Like when Will Gad climbed Niagara Falls, we made some custom things that we would never sell, super sketchy, you know, but we made them for him yeah. to, to, to climb what this thing. What did you thing. make? These wild sort of ice dagger things, oh, you know, because the, the the ice was super aerated, yeah, and yeah. Uh, and really funky, and uh, and we would we would never sell anything like that, you know. So we do get that, and I'm the biggest culprit. Is, I mean, I'm not an athlete like a real athlete like you, but I use the stuff enough that oh, it'd be cool. And then you just have to weigh it: is this gonna is this gonna make sense? Yes or no? Yeah. And sometimes we do it knowing that okay, we're not gonna make. A lot of these, and maybe it's not a huge cash cow, so to speak, but it's super cool. Certain people want it, and it's a BD thing. A great example is our heated chalk bag. You know, the heated chalk bag, super niche. Like, how many people need a heated chalk bag? A super small percentage of the people that are out there climbing. But those that have it, it's pretty cool, man. When you're climbing and it's I really cold, it. yeah. yeah. When it's cold and you're sending the proj and it's 50 degrees, you know, and you're dipping into that warm little chalk bag, it's nice, you know. So we do, we do stuff like that too. But yeah, we certainly get the questions, like you say, about this stuff. It makes me laugh. Yeah, I was gonna yeah. say. I mean, like, have some of those asks segued into your April Fools' ideas? Because I, you guys are known. Uh, you have like yeah. this April Fools. At least there's been a couple things. Where yeah. It's like these ridiculous products. Yeah. In like yeah. A- no, those were all me. <laughs> yeah, those were not. <laughs> those were not asked from the athletes. Those were. Those were me. I wanted a heated chalk bag, so I spun it into it. The the first one with the uh, with the Han Solo, the free yep. solo airbag thing. That was me working with Alex doing that. And there was a lot of uh, there was more strategy, I think, than people think. With that, so the first one was just get people talking. Like BD's lost their mind. You know, we made this super serious thing about this product, and it was obviously ridiculous. And then the next one was the heated chalk bag, and it was kind of a double bluff. Like we thought, oh, this is insane. People, I remember pe- this. People are gonna think. I mean, you guys are haha, very funny. But it was actually a product, and you can buy it. And you can still buy it to this day. It's a real product. Then the next one was the spatula, and uh, from the Free Solo movie, if you remember, like he was eaten yep. and broken yeah. spatula and stuff. So we did that and all the money went to the Honnold Foundation for that. We still sell that spatula to this day. Cool. And then the fourth one that we did was the big number 21 Camelot. Yeah. Uh, and we did that, you know, a fake product to launch a product that was a product. We used it to launch the actual seven and eight. So it was yep. really to confuse people and, and it was a super fun way to do a product launch and great reception from the consumer base. and. Uh, and we still make the seven and eights to this day. Yeah. And I have one of the number 21s at home. No way. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder, you should, uh, is it like hanging on the wall? You could probably set it up as like a, it's hang, a star it's, on a Christmas tree. It's or hanging something. on the wall. It's pretty heavy. Um, <laughs> people ask like if it works. It does work. Like it actually works and everything. And Alex in the video, he's actually placing it. And it wouldn't hold, like if you sat really carefully on it, it would hold like your body weight, but there's so much it could buckle, yeah. you know? Um, But yeah, we made two of them. And one of them's on my office wall at the office and one of them's uh, at home. Cool. Um, Yeah, pretty cool. It's pretty fun. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. And you know, another thing that you, um, I think that you spearhead directly is the QC lab reports, right? Yeah. Um, Dive into that. What's up with that? Yeah. So I started that, you know, when I first started uh, 21 years ago in the QA lab and my philosophy, when, when Peter Metcalf hired me, he, he was interviewing me and he said, so what are you going to do at, at the QA lab? Like, what's your, what are you going to do? And I said, well, the first thing I'm going to do is make sure we don't kill anybody. And he was like, that's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> good answer. Yeah. I like this guy. And then, you know, frankly, I said, I want the climbers out there to know that Black Diamond knows more about climbing gear than anybody. Because we test a lot of stuff and you learn a lot when you're testing all this stuff, you know? And I just wanted to sort of share that kind of information with the public because there's not a lot of that information out there. So I just sort of started, it was super loose, it's still super loose, just taking some random stuff that I think people would find interesting and you know, taking some old draws off the wall and just breaking them and saying, hey, like a new draw is 22 KN and this old draw is 18 KN. That's something to think about. This old draw is maybe 12. So hey, maybe stuff doesn't last forever and you should check you know, your gear if you're climbing a route with fixed draws. 
or with beaners or, or whatever. So that was really the impetus is just to send information out there. And it's not some, I always say, and most of them I say, this is not a PhD level thesis conclusive. This is just a couple little knickknacks of info that you can put in your old noggin. And when you're out there climbing to think about it, you know, and I really like doing them. I, I'm, I just write them in sort of my voice. It's super conversational. It's not too tech. Like I'm like a pretty, you know, smooth shooter kind of guy. And, um, so yeah, I'll just come up and other people will send ideas. I just had a buddy of mine. He had some gear stash in a haul bag and it's all wet and moldy. And he goes, do you want to do it? And I'm like, well, I think we've done one like that. Let me look back and I'll see. You know, I, I'm working on one with helmets. You know, helmets don't last forever. I've seen people out there with helmets just beat to shit, you know. And it's like, hey, man, it's like 59 bucks for a helmet up to 150 bucks. You know, like those things, you know, people understand that bike helmets, one crash and they're done. But, you know, climbing helmets, they get beat up and people just keep wearing them, you know. So just trying to sort of loosely educate the consumer base and the climbers out there just with little nuggets of info. That's yeah. really what it came, came I from. I mean, I think it's like a, such a good idea because essentially what, as you said, you're trying to do is you're trying to have a consumer who is interested in learning about the products. Right. Make that like self-reflective step that so many of us kind of overlook or that like the self-reflective step that just takes time to get there and ask yourself, right. Is my sling too old? Or like, is this setup sketchy? Right. I, my anchor or something. I mean, you know, my just dog, like, my dog peed on my rope. Is it okay? I mean, that's yeah, a pretty yeah. good question, you know, right? like, or, you know, I use a Sharpie as the middle mark. Is that okay? You know, there's just, there's all kinds of stuff out there. Yeah. And, and once again, the goal is, you know, not only for BD to not kill anybody is, Nobody wants anybody to get killed out there. So if there's like a little bit of info that can help people just think about things or understand things, oh, a cross-loaded beaner is this much weaker than if it wasn't cross-loaded or a triaxial loaded beaner or whatever, you know, trusting fixed gear or gear that's too old. So it's just really super loose. I, I generally get pretty positive reception. Like people like those things just because it's just a little, it's just a little nugget, you know, usually takes you know, five to maybe 10 or 15 minutes to read and they yeah. can just plug it in their brains and go, oh, okay, cool. Yeah. Yeah. Move I mean, along, yeah. I had seen them around for quite some time and, yeah. um, preparing for this interview, I read the, the lightning one. Oh yeah. That was the, great the rack got struck by lightning yeah. and yeah. that was like really cool. I mean, yeah. again, I hope my rack never gets struck by lightning, right. but like the story of the guy, yeah, and like yeah. he reaches out and it's just like, yeah, you know, and it's sort of, the results seem to unfold the way you guys maybe anticipated, but yeah. the idea is just it, like, it was cool. It like was a fun story. Yeah. It was about safety and it's like another, you know, aspect in my in your mental toolbox yeah. to like, exactly. just be aware. And we know? have the guys, you know, I started it, you know, for sure when we were much smaller back then. And now we have another, we have a crew of guys that they're, you know, taking over as I'm stepping away. I'm still involved for sure. But we got those guys, we have like, real photographers and stuff now. So stuff looks cooler, you know, like before it was me with a little, you know, one megapixel point and shoot click. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so things are a little bit more pro now, but still the same, same idea with a bunch of guys that are, you know, pretty passionate about just sort of spreading the word, you know? Yeah. And it's, I think it's really important that people understand sort of the, the point and that it's not this definitive thing, you know, like we're not saying, Hey, everybody, you should never do this. We're just saying, Hey man, here's some stuff that we found that looked really sketchy and we broke it and wow, it was sketchy or wow, it wasn't sketchy. You know what I mean? Totally. Um, you know, I think there's something really important even there that you just said that, and it, again, f for me, I'm still learning. You're never not learning right. with like your outdoor pursuit, but um, how like people like specific exact answers for yeah. things. Yeah. That's like, I think how a lot of humans can kind of relate to, you know, yeah. this climbing shoe is for crack climb, right, right? right? Like right. this carabiner is for sport climb, you know, yeah. like, but in all reality, especially when it comes to the, the factor of safety and decision-making yeah. and how you kind of look and operate and make your decisions when you're out climbing, yeah. you know, the, the lab reports kind of help support that idea of, um, like, well, maybe, you know, and yeah. like that answer, and, I'm, and maybe it's hard for you to give that, or maybe it's like, fulfilling for you to give that answer with an engineering background to just kind of tell people like it's a case by case basis. Exactly. You got to think about it. Exactly. Like and that's the thing. I mean, the reality is 
climbing is dangerous. The second you leave the ground, even if you're bouldering, you know, you're two feet off the ground. If you fall and you hit wrong, fall back, hit your head. I mean, climbing is dangerous, right? So as uh, any information that we can give to help people just sort of understand different things, climbing is problem solving, you know, especially when you get into trad climbing or mountaineering or alpine climbing, you know, how do I get myself out of this? What do I do if I drop my blade device? You know, all these things. So just any little nugget that we can help people just, like I say, put in their toolbox and, uh, and hopefully make people, you know, a little more aware out there and, and think things through a little more. Yeah. Yeah. And like, I kind of want to build off that or just this maybe mindset topic we're on because having been a part of climbing for so long, you know, 30 years, what's, what's some of the differences or just like, how has it changed over that period? And, and culturally, I know there's, you know, it's probably changed, but it's also just grown a lot as yeah, a yeah. sport. And yeah. with that comes some really awesome things. And yeah. then- also with that comes some like liabilities, you uh, know? Yeah. So like, did everyone that climbed when you started climbing, was it just like everybody just was in the know and knew or were there's like, so sketchy stuff going on. There, no, there was <laughs> sketchy stuff then, going too. on. There's uh, <laughs> sketchy stuff going on. I'll say, I'll say this. Like I kind of, I kind of say it when I started and you know, obviously there's way older school climbers than me. I started in the early nineties, you know, but when I started gyms, weren't much of a thing. And you read your books, you read the freedom of the hill, you read climbing anchors, you did that kind of stuff. And you went out and frankly, you just kind of figured it out. And like I said, in the Canadian Rockies, you just don't fall. The rock's not great. The gear's going to blow it up or whatever. So you're just really conservative and you're just figuring it out. And I say, oh, we'd survive the weekend. And that was a success kind of thing. Right. I think the biggest difference now, and I, I had some mentors, don't get me wrong, but I did a lot of figuring out on my own. Cause that's kind of my sort of personality. But one of the biggest differences, I think, is gyms. And gyms have a, a huge positive impact. But And I don't want to say negative because it's not a negative impact. But what you have in gyms is the level of climbing going up, obviously, a lot, right? Like people training and that kind of stuff. And the gyms are great and they're social. I mean, I go to the gyms. I love the gyms. Salt yeah. Lake's got a ton of great gyms. Mm -hmm. It's awesome. But what I've seen is you get really strong people in the gym and they go outside and they don't have the problem solving background. They don't know what to do if they drop their belay device. They don't know what to do if they want to, you know, repel and there's only two bolt hangers and not like a chain. You know what I mean? They just don't have that sort of slowly build up all the skills kind of thing because they're climbing 513 in the gym and they go outside and they're like freaking out. How do they get off of 510 that they did kind of thing, you know? So I think that's one of the biggest differences is it seems like everybody kind of grinded their way up sort of the ladder of skill sets back then. Mm. And now you can get really strong really quick and then you can go outside and potentially get yourself in trouble. And yeah. I'm generalizing obviously, totally. you know, yeah. um, but that's sort of, that's the sort of stuff that I see and I'm a little concerned about. And there's been a lot of talk in the climbing industry lately about the sort of the lack of mentorship because, I think that was sort of a thing back then. You kind of hung out with older climbers that took you under their wing and they showed you how to build an anchor and that kind of stuff. And now, like I say, you get these strong climbers and a bunch of buddies out there climbing and then they just don't have the background. And that's where I think the guiding business right now is so important to take people out and to teach them, this is how you build an anchor. This is how you repel if you drop your device. And this is how you, you got to worry about the weather and like and all this kind of stuff. Yeah. yeah. No, I think that's, it's cool how you, yeah, segued into guiding because I was I was also curious and in snowboarding and backcountry skiing like there's a similar growth pain taking place yep. with like backcountry skiing and snowboarding. Right, um, right. In my mind, I I attribute part of it just to like the the filming industry and like Instagram and oh, stuff like for that. Sure. It's it's not like there's like there's always been a ski resort. Maybe that's the equivalent of a gym, right? Yeah. So it's, it's, it's not like there's more ski resorts and all of a sudden more people are going backcountry right, skiing back or snowboarding, but like, but it's blowing up. For sure you know? it's blowing up, yeah. And there's, yeah, there's a, like a lot of kind of internal conversations of like, how do we help educate people exactly. who are like, you know, how do we, how do we help people understand that like, this is the risks you're taking. Right. This is how you like, hopefully make the right decisions right. and educate and all these things. Um, and yeah, there's in snowboard, you know, for us, there's, I've, I've had the benefit of having mentors Yeah, and that's for a very 
niche field, yeah. right? Like just getting into filming and stuff like that yeah. younger on. I, I was fortunate enough to like, you, you know, stand on the shoulders of giants and sort of take it right from there. But, um, that's a great parallel, you, you know, like it's interesting. Cause yeah, I, I think about it a lot and it's cool in climbing that there is the, the guiding industry and even, yep. I don't know what you would do or make like a push for, I don't know, more, more like guided experiences because as it stands now, I think of a guide and I think like, Oh, I need someone to bring me up Denali. So that, yeah, there's right? different things, right? Like, cause I, I know a bunch of guides and, and there's different things that they do. There is like, Hey, you want to go up the grand Teton? I was just in the Tetons this week. You want to go up the grand Teton? We'll get you up there. Check. Or do you want to like learn about lead climbing or anchor building or crevasse rescue or whatever it may be. And you can do that too. Right? So w- what do you want to do? You know? And, when I see the young folks, I saw some young folks up on the Grand, which was awesome. Re- like 13-year-old girl Sick. up there. You know, like uh, really cool. So cool. Yeah, really cool. But when you see these, these kids wanting to learn about this kind of stuff, I just think it's awesome. And that's another thing I say in all these QC labs, disclaimer, like I'm not a guide. You know, I am the furthest thing. I'm a guy that goes climbing. I'm still alive. I have an engineering background and I, you know, work with a bunch of guys that test a bunch of gear. And so like take this information as that, you know, we're not recommending you do this. We're not suggesting, you know, cause we're not guides. If you want like trained professionals, find a guide and they can teach you how to do it like, properly. You know, yeah. very, very, very clear. Yeah. yeah. Hands off. You have experience in liability. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. I don't want anyone coming after me. <laughs> oh man. Cool. Well, you know, I kind of, we've been, we've been talking a lot about climbing and before this interview, I, I kind of reached out to some of your, uh, your colleagues, old yep. friends at Black Diamond and yep. asked like, what would be maybe like a fun question or topic or something yep. like that. And, you know, there's another sport that has seen a big growth as well. And a lot of its, uh, attendees are also climbers and there's a gray area. And I was curious what your thoughts were on trail running <laughs> and, ha- and, you know, have you, uh, <laughs> dipped your toes in the trail running culture? Uh, that's a no. Uh, <laughs> Man, the uh, the trail running world, it's beyond me. Before I think we were rolling, we were talking about about the the guy that just did the crazy 58 miles a day for 45 days or whatever. Like, I just don't understand it, you know? Yeah. And I know, you know, our athletes, a lot of our athletes, trail runners, a lot of the people at BD are trail runners. I'm just not a runner, man. It's brutal. <laughs> I, uh, I don't mind hiking uphill with a pack on, but when it comes to trail running, it's... It's brutal. I, it's brutal. I don't know how they do it. You I know, don't know either. You know? See, yeah, I wanted to talk about this because um, I share a similar outlook that yeah. I'm like, I'm trying to get into running. Yeah. You know, we were talking about yeah, that before right. we started this yeah. as well. And I like, people can just like pick it up. It, there, a, there's a lot of people, I think, in this area and maybe in general that they like pick up trail running and all of a sudden in a year they're doing ultra marathons right, or right, something. Yeah. And I'm like, I don't get it. I don't get it. And I'm also like, well, how and why? I like, know. You know. It just <laughs> seems so painful. I was, uh, we were over in Chamonix a couple years ago and we were uh, crewing for our friend that was running the Tour de Mont Blanc, which wow. is the 100 mile mm-hmm. thing, right? So we were hanging out for about a week before my wife and I and a bunch of these super athletes, we were hanging out with all these guys that we know. We know some of them and, and met some new friends. And a couple of days before the race, they were going to go for a little like four hour run, like up here, across here. And, and I'm, you know, you're hanging out with these guys and you're like, that sounds great. Like, why don't I do that? That sounds like a really fun time to go hang out with these. And I'm like, what am I thinking? Like four hours? There's no way I could run for four hours. I'd like kill myself. I don't know how they do it. I mean, there's guys at BD that are, you know, one of the guys is doing the, uh, the Wasatch 100 uh, in a couple of weeks, other guys have done it. I mean, uh, it's just beyond me, you know, I don't know. I, maybe my body's just not up for it. I've had a bad back my whole life. It's kind of hard on my back. Just give me a pack and I can just grind. I'm not fast. I'll just grind uphill slow and just suck up the pain. Yeah. But no trail running, not for me. And you know, we have awesome trail running athletes. We're working on all kinds of footwear and, uh, I've seen a lot of like, you know, even like the, whatever, like the traction spikes and stuff like that. We have that the traction for like- spikes for, for trail running in and, you know, our, our trekking poles, we have some design for trail running and some awesome backpacks for trail yeah. running and people are into it. And, you know, whenever there's product around, Hey, you know, field test this, field test that. And, you, you know, nobody loves gear more than me in the whole building. 
And when they're like, hey, we got this trail running backpack, it's like, uh, no, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, I'm not going to be able to provide any insight, you know. It's good it's, to set boundaries. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> yeah. Trail running, not definitely not my thing. I kind of wish it was because it'd be it's, fun and get in great shape and that stuff. But I just, it's so just good, yeah. painful. Yeah. Those guys and girls, holy cow, impressive. Mm, maybe you know? in another life. Maybe not. Maybe not. Yeah. <laughs> maybe just more climbing. <laughs> yeah. Maybe just more climbing. Oh man. Well, that dude. That kind of like wraps up everything I was looking to like chat with you about and cover. And I, I've really appreciated your um your like perspective and your insight. And yeah, it's, no it's like cool to just sort of, you know, have you unpackage so many years of like knowledge and, and experience. It like, has been like in a concise period. I could but talk that was about awesome. this kind of stuff all day. Yeah. I love climbing. I love gear. I mean, love gear. I love working on gear. And I think the the climbing community is really special, I think. And I don't know if you listen to uh, Chris Calusa's The Normal Cast. Yeah, and, I love and that. He, uh, and he's a great guy. And um, he always sort of says something along the lines of like, I just think... I just think climbers are better, you know, like just really nice people, you know, like they're just really welcoming. And I find that about, frankly, a lot of the outdoor folks. Like I said, I was just in the Tetons. Everyone's just really nice. They just want to out there, enjoy the mountains, you know, not get killed doing it and just have a good time. So I feel really fortunate that I kind of stumbled into this climbing world. Yeah. You know, um, I've surfed a little bit. I'm like five, nine surfer, maybe. Yep. And, uh, and that they're just not as welcoming and friendly, like, get off my wave, you know, like totally. that, that kind of thing. Yeah, totally. Whereas climbers, you know, people have said this forever, but you can be out climbing and all of a sudden Tommy Caldwell or Alex Honnold rock up and they're, hey, you know, you can, do you mind if I go? Can I go after you? You know what I mean? Like, it's just a really, uh, it's a really cool sport to be a part of. And I feel really fortunate. And my time at BD, I mean, it's just been awesome. And I'm retired, but still associated. So I'm pretty psyched. Yeah. Yeah, I'm winning well, right now. That's awesome, dude. Yeah. Well, thanks a bunch. Awesome. Um, do you have any thank yous you'd like to share? Thank yous? Oh, man. Well, first, I thank you guys. But yeah, I'm, uh, I'm really thankful for my time at BD. And I'm, I'm, you know, with all the previous leaderships from, from Metcalf, you know, who started the company to the current leader, uh, Neil Fisk and everyone in between. And the teams, I mean, I'm not joking when I say like there's a smart, there are a bunch of smart crackers over there. And I learn a lot from these guys, talented guys and girls from, you know, I'm usually in the R&D side of things, but from the supply chain guys, there's so much that goes in to making products, you know, um, supply chain and finance and all these things. It's like, oh my God, like there's a bunch of Einsteins, you know? So I'm, uh, I feel really fortunate and uh, I'm psyched at my time there and I'm psyched to still be associated, uh, but I'm more psyched to go climbing more. Good stuff. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you. Cool. Thanks, thank Nils. Yeah. And thank you to everyone who tuned in. If you like the show, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. And from the meantime, at the crew of Backcountry, we will see you out there. 